from 1989 to 1993, and I was only 11 in 1993. So let me give you the synopsis in case you missed it 26 years ago. Sam Beckett, played by Scott Bakula, is a scientist who's trapped in time in an experiment gone awry. He leaps into the body of a different person each week. He has a holographic advisor named Al, who gives him a little information about the life he's just been put into. But with not very much information to go on, our hero has to bluff his way through many wacky situations. I remember this show, I think, because I just adored the idea of being able to leap into a new job all the time. I could be a doctor one moment and a firefighter the next. I could make connections and solve problems based on what I'd learned the day before. Well, I am grown up now and I've had a few careers. I've lifeguarded and managed a horse farm and a Starbucks. I was the marketing director for a huge Hallmark chain. And now I'm the director of America's oldest community arts council. Really, when you look at my resume, sometimes it's hard to see the through line, but I've always felt a little bit like Sam. Drop me into any industry. Give me a holographic guide or like a decent manager, and I'm gonna learn all I can and uh, make connections and do my very best. Recently, a foundation I work with at the Arts Council invited me to do some consulting work in my area of expertise, which is really brand marketing and storytelling for some nonprofits that are very, very different from my own. I've worked with school systems, libraries, domestic violence shelters, transitional housing programs, uh, soup kitchens, classical music organizations. Basically, I've finally become Sam and got to try out lots of really, really cool careers. And the question I ask myself is, what would happen if we all took that kind of leap? What do we stand to learn if we go into spaces with which we're unfamiliar, armed with only our own industries, knowledge, and expertise? And what if we invite people into our areas, have to explain our most complex, pressing problems when they really have no idea what we're talking about? What is the unexpected benefit of that kind of disruption. Plus, what if we only have an hour of television, 45 minutes with commercials, to do it in? There are numerous examples of cross-disciplinary collaboration solving complex problems already out in the world. Biology informs the way that we look at traffic flow patterns, for example, and inventions for NASA end up in our kitchen appliances. But how do we foster that? How do we make room for that creativity? And how do we allow novel ideas to surface and grow? Well, today, I'd like to be your holographic guide and invite you to take a quantum leap and think about that. How do we make that space? So are you guys ready? In three, two, one. Oh boy. That's what Sam says when he gets dropped into a new life. And being dropped into a new life in space, that's really step one for us. I advocate getting out of the usual physical spaces to get out of the usual physical dynamics. I'm the head of an arts council, so a lot of times I'll take my collaborative meetings to places like a theater stage or an art gallery, but it really doesn't have to be that extreme. Take your meeting down to a green space or the lunchroom. Mix it up. It makes for better TV, and it breaks up physically those power dynamics and entrenched thinking that are already going on. Now, at this point in our episode, usually, Al, that holographic guide, would consult Ziggy, who's like basically the early 90s version of an iPhone, and get some more information for Sam about the problems that he's facing. But it's only an hour episode, so this exposition part has to be like cliff notes. We gotta move through it quick. And that's the next part of our collaboration, too. We need the team to have already done some work distilling the problem, because it's a learning experience in itself. There's this great quote that I really love that's attributed to Blaise Pascal that says, I'd have written less, but I had not the time. And I love it because it's so true. Brevity is tough. And that work in advance is what's going to, to, to help the, the people that you bring in understand what's going on and give you the chance to have creative problem solving together. Let's say an engineering firm brings me in because they're trying to solve problems, and I'm an artist, and they're trying to solve problems with traffic flow, unloading airplanes in a busy airport. And they brought me in because I have an aptitude for visualization and patterns and flow, maybe even finding bottlenecks within a schematic, but I don't have time for uh, big acronyms or internal lingo. I need them to have done that work because they want my 
my skill set and I want to help solve that problem and I need that vent to be crystal clear when we get started. Part of the fun of an episode of Quantum Leap was how comically underprepared Sam was to take on whatever challenge that he had been put into. He had to rely on some quick and creative thinking and some really wild ideas that did not look like they were going to work. That's the next part for us too. In our dynamic collaboration, we want to brainstorm. And during brainstorming, everything is on the table. Everything. And your team has to feel comfortable because then they can throw out crazy and fun ideas. I was in a brainstorming meeting recently with a community mental health facility. And they were having trouble attracting male clients. And somebody, kind of at the end of the day, says, you know what we really need is Yadier Molina. He could be a spokesperson for the org. That's about the only way to get guys in here and folks who they'll listen to. And the whole team kind of laughed. But I said, no, let's keep going with this idea. Because spokespeople do work. Influencers are a key concept in marketing. Why do we all think Yadi is the person to follow? Well, he's a leader in a male space, a masculine uh, sport, and people listen to what he says. So one of the outcomes that came from that meeting we engaged with a local firm, a local manufacturing firm, um, and uh, one of their department heads who had had personal experience uh, with mental health issues in his family. And he was more than willing to do a series of social media videos that talked about the cool services that this, this facility offered that really applied to specifically men in our area. It worked because it's that same wacky idea scaled to our area and use just like any spokesperson or, or media person would use in, in a, a big facility. Now, after all this, Sam is usually basically bumbling through the episode and somehow saves the day. So I'm not here to suggest that every time you get into a cross-industry collaboration meeting that you're going to be the hero who cures cancer by applying your knowledge of theatrical lighting design. But hopefully doing this work of distilling the problem, making room for creativity and brainstorming, and working with people with different viewpoints can open up the, the ideas and form that little seed that can, that can germinate and be a, a great ideas for your solutions that you need to solve your complex problems. So I have to ask myself at this point, especially when I'm doing these things, what, what's in it for Sam? What's in it for the person who's got to go from job to job and solve problems? I mean, it's a big job. He's got to be learning something. Each time that I have gone into these different organizations and been dropped into a new episode, I know I come away with more confidence in my own skill set. I challenge my assumptions. I build on my successes. And invariably, I come back with a cool new idea for my own nonprofit. There is some really compelling social science research that says that overcoming challenges and, uh, and solving complex problems can be as rewarding as a pay raise when it comes to people's overall job satisfaction. It's because humans, we, we love to problem solve. We love to help. We thrive when we feel competent. And exercises like this give us the self-assurance to know that we can face our biggest challenges and come out on top. I also really love the other side of this equation, which is inviting those people to my space and asking them to take on my problems because those diversity in viewpoints and interesting ideas can surface when we really, really get outside of those wheelhouses and go outside of our industry to look for new solutions. I think another thing that I get out of these, these sessions is I remember what I loved about my job and what brought me to it to start with. I remember my spark. And for me, my spark is imagination and creativity. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. But everybody's spark's a little different. An engineer might remember how they love to solve a puzzle. Uh, a clockmaker might remember how they like to see things fit together. A nurse might remember how healing touch can be. Or an accountant might really get satisfaction out of a big column of numbers that all add up. It's that diversity in sparks and diversity in viewpoints that makes creative collaboration worth all the time and energy that it takes to do it the right way. So at the end of the day, is it a little bit strange if I invite a chemist and an actuary into my arts council to help me find ways to install more public art? 
maybe. But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing anyway. The, the disruption is the force that allows the creativity to come forward and solve those complex challenges. So next time we're all in a room together and we're zapped into that collaborative space, I hope we can look around, say, oh boy, and take a quantum leap to solve our challenges together.